Welcome back, Survivors. I'm the Survival Vis, and we're back to Pray for the Gods just to talk and review. This isn't going to be any gameplay stuff like that's going to be going on. I kind of do these after certain videos or certain series I've done, just kind of go into a review and reflection on the game. Points they've done well, points they've done bad, mediocre, stuff like that. And Pray for the Gods is one that I think definitely needs one of these videos to go over, because it's, again, a mixed bag. Like, I'm going to give a review score right now and say 7 out of 10 for what I would review it at. I'd honestly give it 2 scores, 5 out of 10, or 9 out of 10. But together, the average of that is going to be 7 out of 10. And th there's quite a few reasons why. The first one I want to talk about are the survival mechanics. I think they wanted to aim for making the open world have some content to it. Like, Pray for the Gods is heavily inspired by Shadow of the Colossus. But one of the things about Shadow of the Colossus is there's not really much world involvement to it. It's basically start at Temple, get direction to go, and just go, and there's nothing between you and the Colossus you're after. You get the Colossus, and that's the entire thing. I think they want to give Pray for the Gods something more to be involved back and forth. And I do like how like they kind of came up with an idea of it, where, okay, yeah, you have to worry about food, cold, warmth, and that, etc., but I think there should have been a difference than that stayed to the travel of the world. And when you're in a boss fight, whatever stats you're at, or whatever your, like, hunger, warmth, sleep is, it locks itself in at the start and doesn't change until afterwards. That way you do have an aspect of the open world where you have more involvement going from place to place instead of, like, emptiness between. But it doesn't actually impact too badly or negatively hit you on boss fights. Because there have been a number of boss fights that I have played in the series where we run out of food, we run out of warmth, we run out of stamina, and it is super punishing when that happens. Because unless you have yourself fully stocked for it, it's just a negative thing you always have to do. Nobody wants to go up to a boss fight, try it once, and it's, oh, I don't have enough food, okay, I gotta leave the area entirely now, get everything I want, come back, and then hop in. I think if you wanted to keep the survival mechanics and have them impact the battles themselves, make it so the low or, like, depleted needs don't hurt you, like, health-wise, but they add extra challenge. Like, if you don't have yourself well-fed, stamina recovers slower. Uh, if you don't have full warmth, then it's maybe a bit more sluggish for your movements. Like, almost make it a challenge mode, where if you really want to test yourself, Instead of taking away health or stuff like that, where it can basically be impossible, give it so it cripples you more, but then keep when you have high amounts of food, sleep, and warmth, they give you benefits, like you have faster movement speed, your stamina recovers quicker, stuff like that. So that way it's not like how in the last fight from last episode, you can be really punished even if you don't have a way of having food or sleep on you. Or I shouldn't say sleep on you, but you don't have the elixirs to let you sleep and recover that. So that's how I think the survival mechanics should have done. They should have kept more to the open world aspect than be brought into the boss fights. Another aspect I want to talk about, the weapon durability system that. I thought that was actually spot on and I had no problems with that whatsoever. I liked that it was something more restricted generally to the open world and fighting the champions than actually like involved on the bosses, so it's not like you had to have... X of two star quality with, or I should say, a sword of two star quality to defeat this boss. No, I like that they were separate, and if you wanted to, it was there as an option. I do like the the crafting system was pretty nice. Where again, if you needed a new grappling hook, you just had some logs and rope, and there you have one. Stuff like that was nice and approachable. Um, the armor though, the armor needs to be talked about because. It does not feel like it's worth the investment to go find any other pieces of armor when you can just upgrade the light one as far as you can. I think it should have been better handled where the light armor has a pretty low cap for both its cold resistance and its damage resist, but the other armors start at those caps and excel beyond with upgrades. Like have the... I guess it's called the heavy set. It starts you with the same cold and damage resistance that the light stuff does at its highest level, but as you upgrade the heavy, you get more and more damage protection. Whereas for the fur, it's the opposite, you get more and more cold protection. 
So prime example would have been when, say, like, I'm, well, I guess fighting the worms a bit early to say so. But maybe have certain sets that were, like, this helps keep food last longer. This helps keep your um, fatigue. This keeps your warm. Like, something a bit different in that regard. So that way it felt like it has more utility and use. Then just, like, not really a worthwhile investment to go and get this stuff. Because it does make sense to go from your light gear that's just fine in that to then take off all of your warmth resistance for just, like, the damage protection. Like, you have the best of both worlds in the light set, so why go off of it? And that's kind of my thinking there. So that's how that could have been handled a bit differently. I think that wraps up most of the open world. I do think it would have been nice to find some more lore that could have tied into the ending of, like, explaining what's going on there. But the ending is something I really need to go over, because, oh boy. <laughs> Talk about the uh, 5 out of 10-ish score there. So that's that done. I want to go over each individual boss and kind of give them a simple rank system. Either good, meh, or bad. And the first one we're going to start with is the satyr. I'm going to give him a good. He fills his role pretty nicely. It is just your basic, simple fight. Kind of learn the mechanics, how these guys operate, how you can climb them, get around on them, etc. It serves a teaching role, and that's just fine for a first boss. He's not supposed to be a big, grand spectacle, although I do have to hand it. His introduction is a great one, where all of a sudden he emerges from the ice and the snow and towers above. That is a great intro for it, and I think that was one of the high points of the game. Or that's your first introduction to these things, and that's a great one. He's not too complicated, not overly... Not a lot of skill or stuff needed for it. Fills the role quite nicely, and fits that just fine. There's no qualms to him. We'll put him... Again, he's a good... Now we come to boss 2, and this is our meh. The worm, I thought in the previous iterations, when he, like, gets buckled down, you could get right onto him. You didn't have the lake, or... The lake was still there... But it wasn't that you'd have to, like, try to jump or grapple or what. You could actually, like, get onto him. I thought the mechanics for, like, set up around him were interesting. You do get the idea of the worms can act, or, like, little enemies out in the open world can shoot different types of attacks. And they are your introduction and your teaching to the big guy you'll fight. I do like how you have to, like, have his energy balls or the orbs that he spits out used to light up the means to knock him over. But again, his positioning and not really being able to see where you have to go on the bosses is a big problem. Depending on the boss, it's not too bad, but the size of others, it becomes a problem. Shadow of the Colossus, the inspiration again for Play for the Gods, had where you could hold the sword up and you'd have like a triangulation system where all the light beams would start condensing in towards one of the spots. And I think when they were on it, it would give a shine off. If not, it at least told you, okay, there's one there. I gotta try getting to that spot on him. Pray for the Gods only had, if you got in a certain proximity of it, a beam would come out. You need to see it from afar to plan out your route. Let's put it that way. So that's something that could have been remedied there. And that's pretty evident on the worm with how they're like dotted all across it as it's in the middle there. So that was the... Okay, so the first boss was named the Seder, the second boss is the Devourer, or the Big Worm. And we've had a good, a meh, and we're on to the boar now, and this is another good. He was one of the fights I really liked from when I played two years ago. Because it's nothing super complex, it's nothing overly complicated. You know what you gotta do, and it's a great teaching way to get into him. There were a couple of things where, like, I tried to parachute into his area, and I guess I smacked the gate, and that was an instant kill. Or I got trampled under him, but... Those are more, I guess, kind of bugs, but not really intended things. So it's not like they held you back from enjoying it. It's just what it sort of was there. So he was a good fight. I like how you can kind of watch and figure out the timing for when you have to get off the button and he's already fully broken into the charge. He has the second phase that gives you some more stuff to deal with in that. But yeah, I quite enjoyed that fight. That was where Pray for the Gods, again, hit a very good point and I really, really enjoyed it. And that trend actually continues with the Drekki, the fourth boss, which was the Sky Serpent, or basically the Subnautica Stalker in Play for the Gods. That's the first thing I thought of when I saw, like, the mouth almost, is that it reminded me so much of... Or was it Ch Lister Leviathan? It just reminded me kind of like one of the Subnautica monsters or creatures I've gone up against, but yeah. The Drekki is Play for the Gods at its best. If this were, uh, like, a tier list, that's an S tier for me. 
everything is done right and amazingly for it. The mechanics to kind of teach you in are right there as you learn. Like, you have the lake and the little vent and the grappling hook all kind of in sequence, so you know that's what you'll have to do ahead. You have the great opening of seeing it coming down in, and just like the design is amazing. The Dreki Boss 4 was easily, and I think still holds, the best of Pray for the Gods, and is your 9 out of 10 score for it. It is just such a great fight. There's nothing I can really say to improve on it there, it just kind of, well, maybe improve on where the, uh, locations are to, like, the bells on him. But the thing is, because he's like a serpent, you almost can unlock and, like, open up pathways that are ways that guide you to the next step. So yeah, that was the Drekki, that was a good one, and oh, fantastic. And now we come to the Yeti, boss 5, and this is my bad. This is one of my bads. The reason why the Yeti isn't so good, I think is because almost a bit of, like, the legacy behind it. See, Pray for the Gods has spent a long time in early access and being developed and finally getting full circle to release. And I believe the Yeti is the first designed of the bosses to exist. Like, past trailers and gameplay demos and stuff like that, he is the fight that kind of was the concept for Pray for the Gods. I think they wanted to keep that base idea there, but he has not aged well. There's a lot to him that doesn't really, like, feels heavy-handed to explain how his fight works, because, like, two years ago I had the issue with it, and then in this release you saw basically the, the written note of, do this, 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 and that'll let you do stuff to him. I think it would have been better to change up the environment where he's fought a bit, on the lead-in, have it so that way there's a lot of, like, ice patches. Like, he's in a globe, a, not a global, sorry, a glacial basin. Have, like, the undead guys, if some of them hop off of, like, ledges or that, they land on ice. But they're so heavy with their weight, they break through, and they kind of can't move. That kind of clues you in. There's thin ice here. Maybe I can use that for what's coming up, and have exactly that. Instead of having this, like, weird deep snow border patch area stuff that doesn't have much use have an ice field so that way as he's walking around you can try to guide him over to these certain spots where there's not like brickwork or castle work laid and when he steps on him he plunges down and his arms come down to try to push himself up while he's got his arms down trying to push up you just do 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 do, do and up him and that's how you can get on him take out the like weird arrows to the eye and i think that would have been a much better way to have done the yeti He's a bit too basic and too bland and heavy-handed for how you've got to deal with him. When I think of like how the snow slows us down, I don't associate that with something 20 stories tall that is easily, easily above us. We're getting slowed down because the snow is deep enough and we can't push through it. He steps over and through it, so I don't see the snow as like that correlation there. So yeah, he is our first bad, and we come to boss 6 now, the Krogan, or the Big Bird. This guy... I'm going to give a good, but I'm kind of leaning to meh for a couple of reasons. He's good because he's a great spectacle fight. You get to see and just watch it fly around at multiple times. You can see it shooting the fireballs at you. It's a great fight for looks, but a couple of issues are finding where the bell spots are him, on him are. Like, you kind of piece together, okay, I got the head, I got the tail. When I was playing it was, okay... They've got to be on the wings, I think, but I'm not too sure. It wasn't until I took a better look at the arena and looked at some of the pictures, which I think is great environmental detail. The little pictures about stuff going on is fantastic and really adds to help explain what you could do without just outright, like, saying in a written note like the Yeti what you should do. One of the things I have as a downside is, like, when you shoot the bird in the mouth you get the like white flash and i know it's supposed to be like to conceal them making the bird land i would have said almost have it happen and then have like an animation where it like flaps a few times trying to cough out smoke or that and then just like flops to the ground at a certain spot that way you can control it always goes to that spot and it's kind of believable to say well you basically just caused an explosion in its throat it's going to come down but yeah, the Krogan was a pretty good fight. I do lean to the man just because of the bell chimes can be a bit hard to find those spots on it, and... 
again, the white flash kind of breaks you out of the immersion of the fight because it's just like such a static blank screen of please load, wait for it to load. Okay, opened up. So that's a change I'd like to see there. I don't know. I probably won't see it, but maybe for the future, stuff like that. And now, oh, we come to the boss seven. Boss seven, the thrall is just a bad. It is just bad. Like it leads up really nicely, which is, which makes the fight itself a shame because it's okay. Go up towards it, and we into this interesting, like little tucked away cave area. We've never been in one of these super tight and small caves. The boar, we were in a cave, but it still felt like pretty big, openish area for it. Like a huge arena to fight in. But the Thrall, it like claustrophobic you in a way. And the laser seeds. This was supposed to be the mechanic that would teach you and introduce you to what you have to do on this fight. But aside from breaking his one ankle, that's the only role it plays. Or I should say like the thigh armor or the calf armor. Aside from that... They do nothing. The big shrine target thing on his back does nothing if you break it. I don't know. Maybe it does. I still don't know at this point if it was even worth it to do that or not. Like the first episode, you could see how much I was trying to figure stuff out and what to do, but I couldn't piece it together. It wasn't until the second episode of him where I had researched what I needed to do, how you fight him, and then even discovering. Like, the grappling hook spots on these guys can be pretty hard to see with the lighting at times. I think if there's maybe like a little bit of illumination behind the red, or like there's a bit of a glow that would have worked better. But I think they actually handled the Thrall's idea of like what you use the uh, laser seeds for better in the next fight. How I'd improve the Thrall is get rid of the big shrine on the back and the big pillars, because unless they play an active role for how you deal with him, they're just a misnomer and they'll misguide you. That can be frustrating when the game has been... Six bosses up to this are generally all about teaching you... Little mechanics of what you gotta do to unlock, or what will be the fight's like key to uh, defeating it. Even the Krogan. If I actually went through the big gates, you have to use the fire arrows that would teach you to then use the fire arrows to shoot in its mouth. So the Thrall like throws a lot of what works and everywhere else out the window. I would probably say anywhere you have to break armor on the Thrall should have had like the purple glow the leg and calf had, even if you could use other means of doing so. It's just a way to kind of give you more idea of, okay, this can be broken off with this. This is what these are for. Do all this and then you start opening up. Another problem I have with Thrall is that you didn't really get an opening to get onto him all that well. Like a lot of the other bosses, the Sate, the Seder is probably the closest to the Thrall for the opening, but things like the Boar, the Krogan, um, even the, kind of the Drekki in a way, but not overly, the Yeti, a lot of the bosses have this, like, kneeling point, where you can do a certain sequence, and it makes the bosses stop and kneel, and that gives you an opening to get on and start planning your route and practically pursuing that. Because the Thrall doesn't have one, and if you try, like me, jumping onto his leg at the wrong time, you can't really get on there, you aren't exactly sure what you've got to do, it becomes a fight of frustration of, okay, well, there was the laser seeds, but the laser seeds don't really do much. There's the leg, but I can't bring him to kneel down. If I can get him to kneel down, I can get on him. So it's a lot of that piecing together, and then that compounds with other stuff like the survival mechanics punishing you and stuff like that. So the Thrall, take off the big shrine from his back, Make the purple glow that's in his calf and ar or calf or thigh armor go through both wrists so that way you can see, okay, I gotta blast all this armor off, and maybe underneath these there's more to it. That's how I probably would have handled that one. And now we come to boss eight, the Aldenari, or sorry, it's called Release the Aldenari, and this is where the plot, the boss, and everything of the game nose dives down to bad. Like, I am astonished how badly this all pieced together. Like, none of the game builds up to Ragnarok basically happening here. All of the sudden fire giants and lava and volcanoes. Where does this come from? Are there more notes tucked away I didn't find that 
clued in this was going to happen or what? Like, it comes completely out of left field, feels alien, and sure, it might be a spectacle to look at, but it's almost like in the wrong game because nothing builds up or feels like it leans to explaining this. It's just like, thrown in for, ooh, ah, ooh. Why, though? Like, it, it cannot be a question you can overcome. It just hits, why this, though? And I don't have an explanation. There's a lot in that, in all of the finale that is, like, just... Okay, let me keep talking about the boss fight before I get into, like, the plot of that, but... So the boss fight, the three giants are a little annoying, but they're not bad. Like, they have a pretty straightforward thing to them, and you can kind of piece together what you gotta do to climb after you've beat one or done stuff to them. Some of them are a little fast in when they're able to do, like, their laser beams out, and maybe there could be a bit better, uh, like, visual cue to where their strikes are going to be when they, like, attack the ground. But overall, I thought they had their, um... Like, the targets on them done better than the Thrall fight was, because they tangibly felt like they were steps to beating them, and they are. So the Giants, a bit annoying, but not too bad. You get up to there. The worst part, though, is easily the Lava Dragon, or the Lava Worm, or the Worm, or whatever you want to call it. I have not encountered a situation like that throughout the game beforehand, and I... The game was much better for that. The survival mechanics, again, will punish you. You have no way of getting food back or rest back for how long of a fight this is. If you didn't have those to fight with, it'd probably be a much better experience. Because you don't have this extra level of mechanics you're fighting. You just can focus on the boss more. But the boss does need to be said there are some problems with him. Looks alright and fine. It's an interesting design that... It'd be nice to have more time, like, taking it in, but again, because I'm fighting my stamina, my fatigue going down, I have to keep on him. When you get on top of him, the first one isn't too bad to deal with. Like, uh, parachuting towards him, grappling hook onto part of, like, I guess maybe the molten rock, or the solidified rock. Hitting the three and getting the first bell chime in, no problem whatsoever there, pretty easy, straightforward. It's going through to the other sections where it can be a bit frustrating. Like the grappling hook can be a little bit hit and miss at times, but I lean but it leaned a bit more being reliable. My problem is, again, the survival mechanics compound and onto it to make it more frustrating. And there's such poor standing detection for like platforms to it. Like there were so many times with the character, I thought I was onto a proper spot where they were getting up on their own to stand, and it's slipping on down off. Like Unless they're going to be able to properly stand upright on a spot without sliding or slipping whatsoever, there's no reason the character should be trying to stand on their own. I encounter that so much with that fight. And because of that happening so much, you don't have the chance to get your stamina recovered, because again, if you don't have enough food or rest, that won't recover as quickly, and again, it's compounds and snowballs. It's a... Um, Pretty nice spectacle and like, ooh, ah, but there needs to be more explanation for what all is going on. And that brings me to the plot of Pray for the Gods, which completely, like, loses itself at the finale. We kind of get so far this vague idea of every boss we're killing, or every one of these gods we're slaying, is opening up or building up around this temple area. What I thought it was going to be was, instead of, like, the big Ragnarok event, all of the water that was building up in that spring, that area it was building up in was going to open and release down onto those oracles on their tombs. And they were going to actually be the last boss fight. Almost have it so in their death, they cursed the land to be pitched into an eternal winter that will like starve everything else out. And the only way to undo it is to figure out where their curse has been placed into things. And that's in these giant things. It does lean heavily to, like, Shadow of the Colossus, where, like, all of the power is in each individual Colossus. But it could have worked here, too. But have it more so the oracles who are, like, the focal point of the map and are the focus of the temple actually are your boss to fight. And they are your final enemy. Whereas, Pray f or whereas Shadow of the Colossus had it the opposite way, where you actually kind of become a big monster and fight 
little human enemies. I think that would have been a spin, and then it has each individual one of the oracles could have had different mechanics to them from previous bosses around. And then once they're dead, winter or summer and sunlight return to the land and everything starts recovering. How the ending kind of goes is Ragnarok happens and weird god head child thing is freed and... I don't know, I feel like there's so much missing for context to explain it. And then there's also the random tree portal in giant desert and a person goes through who's maybe the main character, maybe somebody else. I... This is one of the cases where vagueness did not work for this game's ending. So much I play for the gods works fairly well up until the last seven, the last two bosses, seven and eight. Up until that point, play for the gods would be at an eight or nine out of ten for me because of like the good spots. There are again the issues of the survival mechanics, but they get taken away. I know there's been some talk for the thrall online and maybe even about like the last boss too, where oh the first time you fight it is pretty frustrating, but then it's a nice experience afterwards. Well, yeah. Uh, that doesn't really justify the first experience being as frustrating as it is, though. Anything after it's done the first time becomes easier and more approachable. That can't really be used as a way to say it's not as bad. The Thrall, the final boss fight, they just really sunk down Pray for the Gods. So, again, I do have to level it here and say, if not for those two fights, I'd probably say Pray for the Gods is an 8 or 9 out of 10 but with how those two fights play out and the survival mechanics being so punishing at times, they could drop Pray for the Gods down to 5 or 6 out of 10. My definitive score is 7 out of 10. I think this would be a great learning opportunity to take forward into other things as maybe the studio's hinting at with the ending. But overall, I don't think it's as bad as some reviews try and put it like 4 out of 10 or other places like that. Yes. When it hits bad spots, it really hits them, and it goes deep down into bad. But at its high points, and when it works, it works phenomenally. Like, the Drecky fight is such a good one. The Drecky fight makes me really think of Shadow of the Colossus, but upgraded a bit to be a bit more action-oriented, and you have more stuff. The Grappling Hook was a fantastic addition, too. A lot can work for Pray for the Gods, it just has to figure out where to dedicate its focus, and maybe some things getting left behind. Like, the survival mechanics, I do know they want to flesh out the open world more, and it's kind of nice to have, but it can't punish you in the boss fights. That's the big thing. So yeah, 7 out of 10 play for the gods. I hope you guys have enjoyed our time with this, with the game and as a series. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but it's one of my little like guilty self-series I wanted to do on the channel. And thank you guys for sticking with it, if you have. Until I do catch you in the next video or series, survivors, please remember, as always, to take care and stay alive.